Well, good morning. Welcome to Stillwater's Church. How's everybody doing today? I think some of you must have had a bad week because that's not a very good response. I'm just going to be honest, okay? Now, I love you. You look great and you're awesome, but that was a horrible response. So, we're going to give you another chance to make up for taking a nap in church, okay? So, how are we doing today? Good. That is much better. That, that is a response worthy of members of this church. But thank you for being here with us today. We're in this series called The Lamb, The Lion, and The Warrior King. We're going through the book of Revelation. And we've learned that if you're going to understand the message from the Revelation, you've got to know that it's about a person, not events. In fact, in the very opening line of the book, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so this is about Jesus. You've got to look at everything through him that he wins, that he will bring everything to justice one day. He will make everything right. And we've got an entire eternity that we're going to be able to spend with him. And he's going to pour out his love and his grace forever on us. And that is a reason to celebrate. That's why God tells us in this uh, book, in the introduction, that whoever reads this, whoever keeps this, whoever hears this, that they're going to be blessed. In fact, it's the only book of the Bible that promises a blessing whenever you keep it at the center of your life. So what is that message to keep at the center of your life? That Jesus wins. That Jesus is the one that not only ultimately wins, but it's all about him. And so when you read it that way and you understand it that way, it makes a huge difference. Well, uh, we're in the fourth message uh, in this series and you got to understand that Jesus appeared, this is the only book of the New Testament where this happened, but Jesus appeared to John and told him to write this. And in fact, he gave individual messages to the churches that this letter was going to. This, in fact, uh, was written as a letter to churches. And so, we're looking at the different churches at this point of what Jesus actually said to these churches. And so, today, we're going to uh, speak on the subject of standing strong in a godless culture. Now, it's really easy to become a culture warrior rather than what God has called us to be, which is a spiritual warrior. There's a difference. You can, and, and by the way, if you pay so much, and I read a lot of this stuff and I see it, and I'm like, these people have lost their freaking mind. Anybody else feel that way at times? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you are like, no, I, I don't think that way at all. Uh, some of you are asleep and you don't even know that I asked a question yet. All right. So the truth is though, it is very easy to get caught up and say things like, it's never been this bad before, which that's not true. Throughout history, you can look at it. In fact, when this book was written, it was a lot worse than the culture that we're in today because they were killing people for their beliefs back then. They were killing people for being Christians. And it's really easy to get caught up into this. And if you're not careful, you'll miss the point of why God has you here to engage in this culture. And it's not to respond to the news and it's not to respond to who's in political power and it's not to lead any of those kinds of protests, but rather it is for us, it is for us to be spiritual warriors in a culture that has rejected Jesus Christ or don't know uh, Jesus Christ yet. And we know this is true because of what was written uh, by the Apostle Paul. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not against humanity, but he talks about the spiritual darkness in high places. In other words, it is a spiritual war that God has called us to. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean that God's called you to be a spiritual warrior? Does that mean that you stand out on the street corner and you yell at people in their cars as they go by? No, that's not what that means. It means that we are to be light in a godless culture. 
It means that we are to be light for people to see Jesus Christ in us and to see the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to show you from this passage today that we're going to read of what Jesus said to this church and how he told them what they were doing right, what he wanted to correct, uh, how they needed to repent or agree with him, and how they needed to build every bit of this around the grace of God. Now, as I was preparing this message, uh, God just really kind of spoke to me and reminded me of something from my past that fit the delivery of what we're going to talk about today. I grew up in North Carolina, most of you know that, and uh, my parents on both sides, uh, grandparents on both sides, etc. cetera, uh, they were from North Carolina from a very, very long time uh, back. They're in the foothills and the mountains of North Carolina. My grandpa on my mother's side, his name was Abraham Zeller Phillips. And we, everybody called him A.Z. Phillips. Abraham Zeller Phillips. Now, he was a very proud man. He was a very uh, self-made man. In fact, he, when he died, he was a very wealthy man. But he started out absolutely broke, completely poor. And what he started doing was he got a mule, it's a long time ago, and uh, they were uh, putting a railroad through there. And he got a mule and he would cut trees for railroad ties and he would take that mule and drag it and he would sell it to the railroad. That's how he got his start. And he bought a small farm and then later he started a store and he was, a, he was an incredible businessman, uh, died a very wealthy man. In fact, he had four sons and one died in the war, uh, but his other three sons that lived, uh, their names were Artis, Odell, and Wendell. Can you say Southern, all right? Artis, Odell, and Wendell. Not Wendell, but Wendell, all right? Uh, because when you're in North Carolina and you're a Southerner by birth, you don't say Wendell, you say Wendell. Wendell, how y'all doing, Wendell? Well, my grandpa, my great-grandpa, A.Z. Phillips, he gave every one of his sons a farm, several hundred acres, uh, he built every single one of them a house and gave them all this farm equipment. So he was a very wealthy, wealthy man. In his 60s, however, he had a massive stroke. The doctors didn't expect him to live. And, and they said that not only would he not live most likely, but if he did live, he would never walk again and he'd never talk again. Well, as it turns out, he was kind of hard to kill. He was a very stubborn man. And uh, he started recovering after he had his stroke. And he would walk. You know what I'm talking about when I say a straight back chair, those old-fashioned looking chairs? He, he would take this chair and use it as a walker. And he would try to walk around on his farm. And whenever he got tired, he would just turn around and sit down in the chair. It was really kind of a smart way to do things. But I remember that my great-grandpa he could only say four things. Now, they said that he would never speak again, but here's what he could say. He could say, you're doing right. You're doing wrong. You said so. And he could sing Amazing Grace. Now, I don't know why his brain was affected that way, but that was all the words the man could say. You're doing right. You're doing wrong. You said so. And he could sing Amazing Grace. Well, what we're going to read today, in essence, that's exactly what Jesus said to this church. He said, you're doing some things right. You're doing some things wrong. You need to repent. In other words, you need to agree with me. You need to change your mind and agree with me. And it all must come through my grace. So we're talking about how to stand strong in a godless culture. How do you do it? How do you avoid just trying to be a culture warrior where you're always upset, where you're always throwing insults, where you're always creating enemies? How do you go from that to being a spiritual warrior, someone that puts the light of the gospel into the community, into your family, and to those around you? Well, let's read uh, together in this passage, if you will, 
uh, with me and we're going to see what Jesus said to this church. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, some place, some translations it says Pergamus, write this. Now, once again, we learned a few weeks ago the angel is the pastor of the church. Okay, so he's saying to the pastor, he's not saying pastors are angelic. He's saying that uh, that word angelos in Greek simply means a messenger. So to the messenger, to the man that is to give the message of God's word to the church, to the messenger, to the pastor of the church, say these words. The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Sounds like the word of God, doesn't it? We'll read about that in a moment. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. How many know what Satan's throne was? Well, the Bible tells us that Satan, he wanted to be greater than God. He was Lucifer, the, the, uh, the greatest uh, archangel there was. He was in charge of worship. And it was through pride that he said, I will go up, 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 up. And he kept on saying what he was going to do and be greater than the most high. And so his was a throne of pride. So he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. And by the way, we don't know who that is. We have no historical record about him. But it said that he was killed among you where Satan dwells. In other words, he was martyred for his faith. And then he says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. I'll explain that in a moment. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them. Now I want you to notice the grace of God in this. He was pointing out what this church did right. He was pointing out what they did wrong. He was saying that you need to repent. The word repent means to change your mind. It means to agree with God. He said, if you don't, I'm going to war against. He didn't say you. Do you know that God does not war against his children, his family? The judgment of God was absorbed by Jesus Christ on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God that he did that for us. And so they were doing some things that he said that they needed to correct. But his, his warning to them was this. That if you don't repent, if you don't change, I'm going to war against them. I'm going to war against that culture. In other words, I believe what he's saying there is that they're going to be hopeless, that they're not going to respond to the gospel, that they're going to miss out on all the things that I have for them. I will war against them. Very interesting. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And by the way, this phrase is in all seven churches, the admonition to all seven churches that Jesus gives and these are actually the words of Jesus that John took down. These are the words that Jesus himself spoke to these churches. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. In other words, spiritually speaking, respond to the Spirit of God. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. By the way, God speaks to every person. Now, the Bible says his Spirit will not always strive with a man. Talking about mankind. And what he means is that he will speak, but if you don't listen, he's not obligated, obligated to continue speaking. That's why it's very important when you feel this sense of the Spirit of God speaking to you, teaching you, uh, inspiring you to do something. And we've all been there. We've all done that. You go to church, you hear the Word of God preached, and it seems like something just gets you right here. You ever done that? You ever felt that? It seems like you know what you're supposed to do. You know what that is? That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. It happens for people that need to be saved. It happens for people that need to turn from something that they're doing. It happens for people that need to release fear 
And God is very clear that when the Spirit of God speaks to us, we should respond. We shouldn't wait. We shouldn't put it off. Then he says this, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay, remember I said my great grandpa, A.Z. Phillips, he said, you're doing right, you're doing wrong, you said so, and he could sing Amazing Grace. Well, let me just give you, these are the four points of the message. First of all, what Jesus said to them about what they were doing right. He said, there are some things that I'm very proud of you about, and there's some things that I believe you're getting right. Uh, In their beliefs, for example, they were right in their faith. They did not deny the faith, and that is a very important thing to hold to, to believe as a church that you hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were right about their faith. They were right about salvation. They didn't veer into this idea that you've got to work your way in order to be right with God. In other words, uh, they didn't believe that the way to be uh, put in right standing with God, the way to become a Christian was by keeping the Ten Commandments. You ever notice that the average American, in fact, this is really interesting, the average American, if you ask them how they go to heaven when they die, they say by being a good person. And they essentially say by keeping the Ten Commandments. That's essentially what they're saying. But the fact is, none of us can keep the Ten Commandments. I can't go through all of them, but even the most heinous one, murder, thou shalt not murder. It says thou shalt not kill, but that word in Hebrew actually means do not murder, okay? Um, And so, uh, you say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Well, did you know that Jesus said if you hate someone, that you're guilty of breaking that commandment, you're guilty of murder? You know why that is? That's the same root sin. And so the fact is, every one of us, no matter how much leeway we may give ourselves, no matter how many breaks we give ourselves, we all fall short. But this church, they were solid. They were doing right about their beliefs about salvation. They said, you know what? Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We believe that salvation comes by faith alone, through Christ alone. And they were right about the word of God. Did you notice that Jesus addressed them? He said, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Why did he say that? Well, Pergamos claimed to have the sword. In fact, that was their claim to fame, in other words. And the reason they claim to have the sword, that is where the majority of capital punishment happened uh, in that, uh, that area of the world in the Roman Empire. They were the ones that said, we have the sword. We are just. We are, the, we are the judicial system. We bring justice to people. We have the sword. But aren't you glad that Jesus is greater than anything else in this world? Aren't you glad that Jesus said, I am the one that has the sword and it comes from my mouth. So he was claiming to be greater than any of their government systems. And he said that he was the one that is just and he is the one that is righteous and he is the one that dispenses justice like no one else. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? Well, the fact is, Jesus said, I have the sharp two-edged sword. Not only was he claiming that he was justice, that he was the one that was right, but listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. That's what comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ, the word of God. So not only is he justice, but he gives us the word of God to live by. He says, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God and everything is naked and exposed before his eyes and he is the one to whom we are accountable. What do they get right? Well, they got their beliefs right and they got the big picture right, that it's about Jesus Christ. So they got that right. They were to be commended for that. But then Jesus goes into what they got wrong. He said, there's some things that you need to correct. There's some things you need to understand. He said that basically there were two things that he had against them. 
that they were following or allowing rather the teachings of Balaam and the teachings of the Nicolaitans. You say, now who in the world uh, were those people? Well, evidently in this church, there was culturally, they had been affected culturally by the teachings of Balaam. Now, Balaam was a Moabite prophet from the Old Testament. And if you remember the story, and it's in Numbers chapter 22, uh, Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to put a curse on the nation of Israel, the Israelites. But every time he tried to curse them, he couldn't do it. God wouldn't allow him, and he ended up putting a blessing on them instead. You say, well, that sounds pretty good. Why would uh, they be against the teachings of Balaam? Well, what Balaam did is he went back to King Balak and he said, look, I can't put a curse on them, but you can destroy them from the inside. And he said, basically what you do is you put a stumbling block before the Israelites. And you know what those two stumbling blocks were? And this is fascinating and it happens even today. It was related to their business and their finances And it was related to sexual morality. He said, if you want to call them to fall, get them to compromise on those two things. Put that stumbling block before them. And we know from reading the Old Testament, that is exactly what happened. Let me tell you what was going on uh, in Pergamos or Pergamum there during that day. They were known for having these trade guilds. You know what a trade guild is? Like in, in our culture today, it would be like an elect. Electricians union, a guild, okay, or um, you know, a plumbers guild, or, or whatever. But uh, tradesmen uh, in that day, they had these guilds, and they would meet, and they were very famous for two things. They were famous for worshiping a false god. In other words, if you did not worship this false god, or at least acknowledge this false god, then you would be shut out from business. You would be really struggling in your business. You would struggle to make money. And the other thing that they did was for their clients, they ended up having this big sexual orgy as a part of their gatherings, as a part of their, uh, their, their, their guild uh, when they would have their parties and they would come together, okay? Now, what would happen is often they would hire temple prostitutes. There was a famous temple uh, in that area. They would hire these prostitutes from this false religion, from this false temple, and they would come and they would be available to the people there. Now, think about it in our culture today. Now, it's likely that we don't have people in guilds or in your business um, you know, saying, hey, we're going to worship Apollo today so that we can all have a better uh, bottom line this year. That's probably not likely. But what happened to the people in this church? Their temptation was this, that they were going to compromise in the area of finances and the area of their morality. And, And what they did was they justified it and said, well, I don't really believe that Apollos is a real God. I'll just kind of go along with it so that I can have the business deals and the business connections. And I don't approve of, uh, of all this sexual immorality, but I'm just going to go and I'm just going to be around the peripheral. I, I'm going to do, I'm not going to completely in, in, indulge in this, but I'm just going to kind of be in the part. Now I want you to hear what I'm saying. There is a great temptation in the church today in order for you to make it in business, in order for you to get ahead financially, to compromise in those two areas with your morality. And that doesn't just always involve, hey, you know, we're going to strip clubs, okay? Or we're gonna go have sex with prostitutes. Um, It can be something as simple as saying, well, you know, you gotta lie to get ahead in this, in my business. If you don't stretch the truth a little bit, if you don't hide a little bit, if you're not just a little bit dishonest, you're not going to make it. You're going to get crushed by your competition. 
And I realized that, uh, you know, we're not going to worship the God uh, of Apollos or uh, the God of Baal, which was, you know, a, a fertility God that, you know, was related to finances. We're not going to worship that, but we're going we're gonna to compromise our biblical beliefs about finances. And can I just tell you this? There's a great temptation in our culture today to, to compromise. In other words, instead of being a spiritual warrior, we become a culture warrior. And we're like, yeah, we believe, uh, you know, what they're saying on the news and we believe all this stuff and we, but you know what? We're going to indulge just so that we can get ahead financially. Can I tell you this? God promised that he would be your provider and you do not have to compromise to get ahead in business. You do not have to compromise to get ahead financially. In fact, I know this for a fact and I've seen it work so many times. Things that people that uh, refuse to compromise, instead God opens a door that no one else could have opened for them. What am I saying? I'm simply saying that they did wrong when it came to this. And I believe in our culture today, we are tempted to do the same kinds of things. Maybe not exactly like they did, but we are, we're greatly tempted. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans were Gnostics. And the Gnostics worshiped knowledge and they thought you had to have this experience. And so, uh, the Nicolaitans were the ones that worshiped knowledge and the, the, the prophets of Balaam as he described them in this, they were the people that in the culture, they said, we're going to compromise with our money and with our morality. And can I challenge you today that if that is true of anyone in this church, we need to do what he told them to do next. You need to repent. He showed them where they needed to repent. The word repent means to agree with God or to change your thinking. We must agree with God and be in the culture, but not of the culture. There's a difference. God has called us to be spiritual warriors, not culture warriors. He has called us to be faithful. And he said, therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, it's very interesting, as I've already pointed out, that God did not say that he was going to war against the church. When the church loses its uniqueness, when the church loses its convictions, when it loses its belief in who God is, that not only does he save, but he is the provider. He is the one that takes care of us. He's the one that protects us. I understand how easy it is to compromise in a culture, particularly like the one we've got now. I mean, we live in a culture that will attack you if you even say something like, well, this is a woman and this is a man. I mean, we live in a crazy culture, right? Yep. And, and the truth is, God has not called you or me or this church to stand on the street corner and to throw barbs at people that do not know Jesus Christ. Now, here, here's my question for us. Why does it surprise you that people who are not Christians don't act like Christians? <laughs> Do you know what happens when a church or a, a Christian becomes a culture warrior? They focus on morality rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what they do is they say, well, ain't it awful? We got to do something about this. We got to vote all these bums out of office. Now, I'm not suggesting that the bums don't need to be voted out of office, okay? Uh, look, I, I don't like very many of them, period, okay? The, but the truth of the matter is, it is very clear what God has called the church to do. And that is to be the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the community. That is what God has called us to do. Now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't be involved in politics. Do it to your heart's delight. I, I hope there are some good Christian politicians from this church that are going to run for office one day. If you run for president, I'm going to vote for you, all right, as a part of this church. If you run for governor, if you run for dog catcher, I'm going to vote for you, all right? 
We need good people, good Christians that have a strong belief in God in our, in our governments. I, I'm not suggesting that we don't. But I'm saying that's not the answer. If you think that having Christians in all the political positions is the answer, you're missing the point of what Jesus said. He said, look, we, this church is good, you're strong, you're getting it right. But there's some things you're getting wrong. You're allowing this culture to rub off on you. You're compromising in the area of money and morality. And you're thinking that by doing this, you're blending into the culture. He said, but if you don't repent from this, I'm going to come and war against them. Them. Why did he say that? Why didn't he say against you? Well, I've already told you because the truth of the matter is our job is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. It is to be light in the community. And that's why the church, in my opinion, is not a place for politics. Because in this church, I promise you this, we could get a whole lot of differing opinions about politics. If we took a survey and found out who you voted for, or even if you voted, um, we get a lot of different uh, answers, I'm sure. And I want you to understand, God has not called the church to vote for a particular party. God has called the church to be light. And that's our job. Once again, if you think that I'm suggesting that morality doesn't matter, you're missing my point because I believe it matters. I'm probably stronger on this than most people are. I'm very conservative. I get that a lot of people aren't. I'm very conservative not only in what I believe from the Word of God, but politically as well. But God has called us to be light. He said, what you need to do is to repent. And changing the culture requires gospel warriors, not culture warriors. And that's what God has called us to do. And then here's the last thing. Remember my great-grandpa, he said, you're doing right, you're doing wrong. You said so. And he could sing Amazing Grace. Well, here's the last point. What they needed was God's grace. And I love this. Notice the two things that Jesus promised to them. By the way, this is important that you understand this. Anytime you see what he's saying, if you'll endure to the end. He's not suggesting a works-based salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying to him who conquers, he says this to almost all the churches, these seven churches. Do you know what he's saying? You gotta trust in me. Jesus didn't call you to conquer. He said, I have conquered for you. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And notice what he promised to this church that did not compromise. To this church that would stand strong in their belief in God, in their belief in Jesus Christ. He promised them two things. And these two things are tied somewhat to the gospel. They're tied somewhat to salvation. But then they're also tied uh, to, as a church, what God promises to do for this church. Notice the two things. He said, for those of you that will do this, he said, I'll give you some, you some of the hidden manna. Now, you know what I believe the hidden manna is? Remember manna from the Old Testament? That was food from heaven. You know what I believe Jesus is referring to? Because remember, when he begins to speak to this church, he said that his sword came from his mouth, the Word of God. You know what I believe that he's promising to people that will refuse to compromise in their belief in the gospel, refuse to compromise mor morally and, uh, and with their finances. You know what I believe he's promising? He's promising that he will speak to them from the Word of God. You ever pick up the Bible and you're just, you're in a bad place? You need help? You need hope? You need healing? And you ever just pick it up and all of a sudden God, the Holy Spirit, reveals something to you that you read and it's just like, man, this was incredible. You know, I believe God promises to the church, to the Christian that lives the way he said to live here. He's going to reveal things to you from the word of God that will change your life. I know it's happened to me and I'm sure that it's happened to many of you as well. 
And I believe that God promises that. And then he promises a white stone. Now you need to understand that in this culture, when this was written, a white stone and a black stone were often used when people were being judged. And if you went before this jury and they gave the black stone, what that meant was you were guilty and you were gonna receive judgment. And whatever the sentence was for that crime, that's what happened to you. But if you were given a white stone, then that means that you were acquitted of any and all crimes. You know what God promises for you and me when we come to him? Complete acquittal. Complete forgiveness. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're guilty of, Jesus said, I came into this world to save sinners. And friend, if you are a sinner, then you qualify for God's forgiveness and for God's salvation. Thank God he gives to us a white stone. And he offers us that complete and total acquittal in the eyes of God. And so, in conclusion, what is God saying to us? He says that really if you're going to be a gospel warrior, if you're going to live that kind of life, there are three things that you need if you're going to battle against a godless culture. And it's going to be different than what you think. But here are the three things that are identified in this text. Number one, you need the Word of God. What I'm telling you is that when you're dealing with your children today to try to teach them truth, you need the Word of God, not the Word of some uh, talk radio host, not the Word of some person on the internet, but you need the Word of God. Number two, you need humility. He said some of you have, you know, been living in this area where Satan's throne is. As I've already explained to you, you know what Satan's throne was? It was a throne of pride. And you know what you and I need if we're going to do battle in this culture? We got to have the Word of God and we got to have humility. Don't think that you're going to win people to Jesus Christ with pride and arrogance. Very few people have ever been won to Jesus by arguing with them about what's right or wrong. Very few people. And there are some. And I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have apologetics or we shouldn't have truth. I, I'm not suggesting that. But people are one to Jesus Christ through people that in humility love them just like they are. That's why in our mission statement it says bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because if we're going to do what Jesus said, we've got to have humility and love others in humility. And then the third thing we've got to have is integrity. I want you to think about this be kind of hard to talk to somebody about Jesus if you're taking them to a strip club. <laughs> Heard about one guy that said he had started a ministry uh, to strip clubs. He wanted all the strippers to know about Jesus. Uh, let me just have the attention of all the men, all right? God ain't called you to do that, all right? So, now I'm not against somebody, a lady or somebody, I'm not against ministering to those people, but God hasn't called you to go to the strip clubs, you know? It's like with this dollar bill, I also give you a gospel track, all right? So, no. So what do we have to have? We gotta have the word of God. We've gotta have humility. And we gotta have integrity. And that is how we live in this culture. And that's how we influence people in this culture. And that is how we live to be able to battle in a godless culture. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us today. Lord, to live with integrity, to live the way you've called us to live. You, you called out this church. You said, man, they were doing some great things. There were some things they needed to correct. They needed to agree with you. And they needed to realize that it's all according to your grace. God, thank you for that. I pray that you'd help all of us today to follow you with all of our hearts. Now, before I finish my prayer, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? He might be speaking to some people about your business dealings. He might be speaking to some about your finances. He might be speaking to some about your integrity, your morality. I get that. Today, if you 
want to receive Jesus Christ, if you're not sure of your salvation, I encourage you to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me right now. And then finally, I'm going to end my prayer praying for the children and the youth in this culture. I want to say this. If you're going to be a culture warrior, if you're going to be a gospel warrior, you need to have your kids here at church. Everyone that has preschool children, everyone that has elementary age children, everyone that has middle school children, everyone that has high school children, you need them involved. You're going to be without hope if you don't have the church partnering with you to teach the Word of God. It's not just the church's responsibility, but it is your responsibility as a parent to make sure that they are a part. And so today, let's pray for our children, not only of this church, but of this community as well. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd help each of us, Lord, to have our kids involved, to follow you with all of our heart. God, I pray that you just help us today as a church to be gospel warriors. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.